Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, niter bluing. So today I'll demonstrate the process known as niter bluing. It's used by uh, knife makers to put a blue or colored patina onto steel and iron parts like cross guards and pommels and things of that nature. Um, in this particular video, I'm going to actually be doing it on Damascus steel, but it works fine on uh, normal steels also. More on that later, so let's jump right in. Niter bluing is accomplished using liquefied salt solutions. Now, there are several companies that produce niter bluing salts, including the ones that I'm using, Brownells. I get the impression that every maker has their own formula, but I believe they all use potassium nitrate along with sodium nitrite and or sodium nitrate. But the basic idea is the same no matter who makes it. So a quick note about niter bluing as opposed to other kinds of uh, bluing processes. There are a whole bunch of different bluing processes that are used for knife parts, sometimes for firearm parts and uh, whatnot. Uh, there's cold bluing, there's hot bluing, there's heat bluing, which is not the same thing, parkerizing, rust bluing, all kinds of different things. Um, if you want to blue something, if you want to get that blue patina onto something, uh, it's worth doing a little research into them beforehand uh, so that you can get the right one for your application. Some things are called bluing, uh, including niter bluing, which doesn't necessarily even produce a blue color. So a uh, lot to think about before you get started. So let me just talk specifically about this type of bluing, niter bluing. You know, why would you use niter bluing as opposed to some other technique like a cold bluing or whatever? The advantages of niter bluing are that it doesn't take a lot of incredibly expensive equipment. It takes a little bit of equipment, but not, you know, super complicated stuff. Uh, it can produce a wide variety of colors from straw to blue, purple, even to a kind of silvery color. Uh, and the colors are really nice, really bold. The main disadvantage is that it's not super durable. If you're going to use it in some position where there's going to be a whole lot of abrasion to that part, uh, it will wear off eventually. We start by dumping the salts into some sort of heating device and heating them up. The key point here is that the process is very temperature dependent, so you have to have some way of roughly measuring the temperature. If you're doing a lot of this, using something like a lead melting pot is a good approach, but you can just use a stainless steel pot like this. I'm not going to be using it in my kitchen, by the way, I keep the salt stored in here all the time, and it's heated up with a propane burner. I'll use a pyrometer to gauge the temperature, aiming for about 650 to 675 for a blue color. There are heat treating thermometers that are a lot cheaper than a pyrometer and those will work just fine. So a couple of quick safety notes. I'm not a safety Nazi, you know, but uh, there are some things you want to be aware of with, uh, with hot salts. You really don't want to splash these things on your skin at, you know, six, seven hundred degrees. Uh, so I wear eye protection, Kevlar gloves, long sleeves, and so forth. Now, under no circumstances should water come in contact with the uh, hot salts will vaporize the, the water and splash stuff all over the place. So you really want to avoid that. That also means that the pot that you're using, you want to make sure it's nice and dry before you add salts to it. Next, a word about prep. The finer the finish on the steel part that you're using, the better the results. This isn't the place for a long disquisition on sanding and polishing, but a really nice, clean, pretty buffed surface will produce really bright colors. The fineness of the finish has a very strong influence on how that color comes out. Now in today's demonstration I'll be showing Damascus steel fittings for a Japanese sword. So in addition to polishing the steel I'll etch it in ferric chloride to bring out the Damascus pattern. Obviously if you're doing conventional steel you can skip that step. One quick note though while we're on the subject of ferric chloride if you want a matte finish then etch that steel very lightly in ferric chloride. That'll sort of roughen up the surface a little bit and that will give you a much more matte kind of color as opposed to the more translucent, shiny kind of color that you'd get if you just have a nice, clean, polished surface. Finally, before bluing, I'll thoroughly clean off all the oxides left by the etching process. If you don't, they'll rub off later, taking a lot of your color with them. The final step before going into the bluing salts is to degrease the steel. 
You can do this with soap and water, solvents like acetone, whatever your favorite degreasing method is. The point is, you want dead clean steel, no fingerprints, anything of that nature on them. Then I'll suspend the parts on iron wire. Now you're ready to dredge the part in the salts. Some people go in, bring them out, and quickly wipe off the white salt crust that forms on the steel. Now this is not really practical for large parts like this sword guard. And frankly, I don't notice the difference anyway because the salts will redissolve quickly as the part reaches the correct temperature. You'll also notice little bubbles forming. I kind of jiggle the parts around to dislodge the bubbles, making sure not to splash the salts. I don't know that this is necessary, but it's how I do it. My thinking is that the more surface area that the salts contact, and the more that they're contacting the exact same chemical, the more likely you are to have a really even color. Pull them out occasionally to check the color, and when you get a color you like, you're done. It's that simple. Depending on the size and thickness of the part, it shouldn't take more than a minute or so. Out they come. I quench them in water immediately. The reason for this is that niter bluing can produce a wide variety of colors, from yellows and browns, all the way through blue, purple, and a sort of silver at the high end of the range. Now this color is dependent on the thickness of the oxide layer that's produced. It's not like there are different colors of material that are actually being deposited onto the steel. If you pull the part out and admire it for a while, that oxide layer will continue to thicken and change color on you. So quench them immediately. If you plan to go for yellows or browns or something like that, keep the temperature down in the 500 to 550 range. If you want blues, 650 is a good temperature. Purples, you can go on up 25 to 50 degrees from there. Now, the exact color you get will depend on a lot of factors. Different steels blue at different rates. So, a little practice with the specific steel and surface finish you're using will tell you what combination of time and temperature will give you the perfect color. But basically all you're doing is just watching it as the color changes and as soon as it's done, it's done. Now the good news is that if you goof up, it's very easy to polish off the patina and run through your routine again using a different time and temperature until you get it right. After quenching, I'll wash my parts in hot water, not just cold water, hot water, to dissolve any remaining salts. You don't want any of that salt hiding in cracks and crevices as it can cause problems with other parts of your knife down the line. I do a final cleaning with Windex, rinse them off with hot water, dry them, and then coat them with WD-40. So that's about it. Pretty simple process. Now one quick note, a lot of people ask me if you can use this on blades. You don't want to use this on uh, Damascus steel or a normal blade. Uh, you only want to use this on fittings. The reason for that is that at these temperatures, 600 plus degrees, you're going to uh, mess up the temper of the steel and uh, soften that blade. And that's something you really don't want. All right, guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon.